Hey everyone, Bernard here and I hope you're all staying safe and well welcome to my latest Citizen Channel feature. Uh, please, if you are new to the channel, push that subscribe button and push the bell notifications as well so you know when these vlogs are coming out and uh, of course do lots of stuff city past and city present so uh, please push that uh, notification button. Make sure you know it's set to public as well, don't forget, otherwise you won't get to know but uh, press that subscribe button. Please check out my links on screen as well for uh, Facebook and Twitter and also don't forget I've got a little film and TV channel on YouTube as well so if you want to have a little break from football check that out and of course uh, on Facebook and Twitch I will check every few days and follow and friend everyone back on there and also don't forget I have a, I'll have a sort of links with Blues in Business on Twitter they promote uh, city fan related small businesses, local businesses which need our help perhaps more than ever these days don't they so please don't hesitate to get in touch with me if I can promote or put some stuff out for you in, in one of my uh, magazine vlogs my city magazine vlogs and don't forget I'll always give a shout out to Logs local projects or charities etc etc just get in touch anyway please enjoy today's today's citizen channel feature thank you right today's episode uh, is actually split into two parts i think i spent more time researching this and actually uh putting it all together than this gentleman actually stood it uh, sat at his desk working this little job of managing Manchester City yes yeah, so uh, and we're going to go back to October the 7th 1996 this is part one of a two-parter uh, as we look at uh, well yeah a few raised eyebrows when a certain Steve Koppel uh, was appointed uh, by of course uh, the wonderful Francis Lee uh, to begin a uh, what would turn into a 32-ish, uh, so I've seen 33, I think it was about 32 days, uh, reign as a manager at Manchester City. So look, join me today as we sort of look at this extraordinary event, even, even for City it's quite extraordinary. A paragraph I'd say, not a page in uh, City managing history, probably a paragraph wasn't it? Uh, in the history of managing Manchester City as we look at uh, Steve Koppel managing City, 32 days at Moss Side. Part one. Yep, our once knight in shining armour, of course, Francis Lee, was having a little trouble. Uh, his armour was certainly uh, becoming a little bit duller by the day, wasn't it? Uh, the City fans and the club were going from crisis to crisis and we needed uh, we needed a steady hand, didn't we? We needed, we needed a manager to calm things down after, uh, of course, the World Cup, the World Cup winner, wasn't he? Yeah, Mr. Alan Ball. Did you know that? I'm not too sure you did. He'd gone. Uh, even George Graham. Remember George Graham? He'd shown an interest, but that was possibly to try and get a, a few more quid out of Leeds United, which is where he wanted to go. So, yeah, he'd shown an interest, put threw his hat into the ring. Uh, it didn't didn't stay there very long, mind you. Uh, and even even Dave Bertie Bassett, Dave Bassett, yeah, even Dave Bassett had turned us down. So perhaps, I don't know, perhaps in sheer desperation, as certainly as far as some City fans thought, we turned our eyes on an ex-United uh, player. Yeah, not not overly impressed with City fans, certainly of that ilk, of, even now uh, when this happens, but... Uh, yeah, a player that sort of had tormented us. He, he wasn't. He didn't. He wasn't covered in glory, Old Trafford. I mean, they weren't always massive, you know. United. I mean, in the seventies when he was playing, all he ended up with in about eight seasons was an FA Cup winners' medal and a, a charity shield winners' medal. That was it. So I mean, this massive team called United. They weren't always winning things week uh, year in year out, you know. But uh, it did cause us a few problems. I, I remember watching Stevie Couple many times playing against City. I wouldn't watch him otherwise, or probably for England as well. But uh, yeah, so he did torment us a few times and as it turned out as a manager, he would do so again, unfortunately. City, well, we sat 14th, yes, but we sat 14th in the second division or the first division, if you like. Uh, obviously, they had the Premier League and then the first division, but let's look the 14th in the second tier of the Football League. Well, let's face it, it would take a brave man, you know, all credit to him to, to get this sleeping giant and uh, obviously into the breach uh, step, Mr. Steve Koppel. Bristling, bristling with health and vitality, wasn't he? Yeah. Mm. In his first uh, press conference, he hinted, he actually hinted at the length of time he would stay at City. He said, I'm an animal who tends to roost wherever he stays. Didn't roost very far, and perhaps it was a bit too splintery for him, the wherever he was roosting. He told reporters, I was at United and Palace for nine years at peace, and I hope that City's a long term rather than a short term move. Well, I'm sure, we all hope that as well, Steve. 
Well, he would last about eight years, 11 months less than he stays at uh, United and Palace. But, uh, yeah, I'm not speaking from hindsight. I mean, in, in the same way, the arrival of a certain Mark Hughes of many, many years later had, uh, had done. The, the arrival of Koppel didn't inst instill, any, instill any confidence or inspire me. And obviously many City fans felt the same. Um, I didn't want any ex-United players at my club, to be honest with you. I don't want them anywhere near my club. I know that's a bit petty and, and a bit sad, but that's, that's how it is. And that's how it was. And that's probably how it is now, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, there you go. It is what it is, as they say. And I suppose after all, surely we, we looked at it and we looked at the mess we were in thinking, well, it couldn't be any worse in Alan Ball, could he? But uh, mm, uh, who knows, perhaps. Uh, yeah, away from the press conference, uh, Lee and Koppel had apparently an understanding when you talk to all the journalists talk uh, now, you look back at what the journalists have said. I mean, Paul Hintz, of course, a well-known uh, big ex-City player, big City fan and obviously journalist. Uh, the story at the time, he said, was that uh, he'd given Koppel six games to assess the team. Well, there's a coincidence, wasn't it? This is before he, kissed, he took charge. Uh, if Koppel was not aware of how hands-on this new chairman Lee was, he soon would discover and that was never something Koppel would appreciate if you speak to people who know and knew him. He didn't like uh, he didn't like being my, but he liked to, to get on get on with the job and uh, uh, obviously he didn't want his chairman with uh, being too hands on. So obviously that was never going to bode well, was it, with Francis Lee? Sure, surely he knew that. Uh, it was a strange decision as well by Koppel when he considered he was also having a lot of uh, personal problems at the time. Uh, he was going through a divorce uh, and obviously. He was upset at not seeing his son every day, very close to his lad. And obviously moving up to Manchester, his wife Jane remained, of course, down in Surrey with their 10-year-old son. So it was personally, it wasn't the greatest time for him either. But as a football man, I suppose he'd, uh, he'd done OK at Palace. It wasn't fantastic, he'd done OK uh, with a limited budget. But he had, he had been given money to buy players, etc, etc. And there's no doubt he wanted this challenge at a bigger club. And uh, no, all no disrespect to Palace, but yes, yeah, City are a bigger club uh, with larger expectations. Even then, even at this stage, even in the 90s, you know, we still had large expectations. Um, so it's more or less agreed that perhaps Koppel had six games to assess what he had. What he had at Main Road. Um, so what we're going to do now is look at how those six games went uh, individually. I mean, Koppel's first game in charge would be at QPR. On October the twelfth, nineteen ninety six. Previous to this, uh, previous to this, thousands, thousands of us have been at uh, Bramall Lane, uh, singing what the is going on. Uh, obviously, as we we suffered a two nil defeat at Sheffield United, despite sort of battering them for most of the game, and that seemed to be a uh, something that kept kept reoccurring a lot for City at the time. Asa Hartford, of course, was uh, in temporary charge still at the time, and. Uh, I say without uh, <laughs> we with all the dominance we had, we lost two 0 And this, don't forget, this was followed very shortly after a, a two-legged defeat against the mighty, the mighty Lincoln City. Of course, that's a horrible history in itself, which I'll probably touch upon somewhere else. But uh, yeah, we were dumped out of the League Cup, um, obviously uh, <laughs> by Lincoln City at five-one over the two legs. We couldn't even win the main. We couldn't even win at Main Road. It was absolutely abysmal. So that, this had followed on from that, and this was the state. City were in at the time. At least we got a break from that. At least after the Sheffield United game, it before another four, a couple of weeks off, and that's what we were glad of it in those days. We we're glad that we didn't have to take all the stick from the United fans at work and etc. Where or at schools for the younger ones and stuff like that. So it was fourteen days before we we would have to suffer again as it was an early season break. But finally, after five weeks without a manager, which seemed a long time, didn't it? But hey, a lot could happen in five weeks, can't it? Uh, Alan, since Alan Ball had left City as manager, we sort of kidnapped, handcuffed and drugged this uh, Stevie Koppel, obviously down to Main Road to take up, take over. Uh, at least he had a few days to, to have a look at his new players, didn't he? And see, see what he had, see what talent was there. I'll use the word talent very loosely. Uh, and obviously then we had that Loftus Road game on October the 12th. Uh, nine of Asa Hartford's team against Sheffield uh, started again that game for uh, Steve Koppel, probably because of the lack of alternatives. Um, what I'll do as well on going through this is quite interesting. I'll also quote the opening paragraphs of Brian Brett's Manchester Evening News reports because they're quite funny. They're, they're sort of just a moment in time in themselves, the first opening paragraph of his match reports. And they do sum up City perfectly at this time as they go from... Good to bad to everything. Well, not really in between, just from good to bad. The lineup against QPR was uh, Dibble, Brightwell, 
uh, McGoldrick, Lomas, Simmons, Russell, I think it's spelled Wassel, W A W S A W L, some of it, Clough, Dickoff, King Tladzit, and Rossler. Yeah, and the Manchester Evening News, I've got I've got these excerpts from the season here. Uh, summed up uh, a pleasing, a pleasing, if not fantastic start for Koppel. Uh, let's face it, it wasn't always one of our luckiest grounds, was it? Uh, a Loftus Road, uh, QPR. And the headlines, Blues Show Bottle, so that's not too bad, is it? And the opening paragraph, it was the blue moon that eclipsed everything at Loftus Road. Good old Manchester City ushered in their ninth manager in 11 years in traditional style, gifting the opposition a couple of goals inside the first half hour. Yeah, well, that sort of goes on from there, but obviously it didn't end up too bad, did it? The summary of the game, uh, yeah, I mean, QPR were having problems of their own. Uh, they had a new, uh, they had a new uh, double act in charge, uh, uh, Mr. Stuart Houston and uh, Bruce Reock. I think I think it's Stuart Houston. I don't think that was his name. And uh, Reock were in were newly in charge, and uh, a certain player wanted away as well. A certain player who actually went on to score the first goal in this game for QPR and still got jeered by the QPR fans. They're a bit like us, aren't they? Uh, of course, a, a gentleman called Trevor Sinclair was getting a bit of stick from his own fans. So as, as stated there in that paragraph, City were 2-0 down within 30, 30 minutes. A lot of City fans uh, didn't get in till late. They were stewarding problems at the at the turnstiles, etc. But unfortunately, they got, probably got in just in time to witness going 2-0 behind. Uh, so obviously that wasn't too, you know, so it could have been worse. It could have been better, couldn't it? They could have just been stuck outside. But fortunately... While well, seemingly get a nosebleed, he, Mr. Brightwell ended up uh, in in the opponent's box, uh, and obviously he actually got a a goal back for City just a minute after the QPR second goal. So it wasn't too bad with the help of the underside of the bar. But there you go. That's another story. We we were quite good at hitting the woodwork in those days as well. And it was more or less City then for the rest of the game as QPR defended sort of wildly, not always legally. But it would be as late as the 80th minute before City got a deserved equaliser. After hitting the woodwork three times, um, finally a goal bound by Kinky, by Kinky was uh, handled by the QPR on the line. He was then sent off and then Kinky himself hit home the penalty to give us a 2-2 a draw. Uh, Koppel reflected on his first game in charge in the Manchester Evening News. I have a little section called Koppel Verdict and this is what he said. In the end, it was a little bit frustrating. It was a helter-skelter of emotions at one stage. It was, oh no, 2 0 down, and the goal, and obviously it's doing Piccadilly Radio there, isn't it? And the goals were conceded by like the Keystone Cops, which is an old black and white comedy for you guys out there. Thankfully, Ian Brightwell got a belting goal that put us back in the game. We were not too far away, then going in at 2 0 down might have been too far away, but at 2 1, the players sensed they were capable of getting something back. I didn't have to say much at half time, just tell them to relax. In the second half, we did the right things again, and I I think a neutral observer would agree that we were a team more likely to win. We hit the woodwork three times and probably had one legitimate penalty claim turned down. Kinky is an exceptional player. We have to try and harness his ability more consistently. It was good for me personally to be back and in the dressing room with a unity of purpose. All the players were desperate to get a result and that showed. Yeah, the player ratings, Dibble got a 7, Brightwell 8, McGoldrick 7, Lomas 8, Simmons 7, Wassell 7, Summerbit 8, Clough 8, Dickoff 7, Kinkladzi 9, Rossler 7, uh, Subs, Cash, Cavalash, Villa, he came on he got a six the referee john brandwood no i have no idea he got a four and uh, the city man of the match was um mr king Clancy. so not the worst uh that goal that's a qpr well, let's get the page over for the next one we're going to talk about so not the worst start and just uh three days later it was a trip uh you know you have two weeks off and then you get these games you know like like buses they can't all come at once a trip back down to the london area in a game against a struggling reading and he must be struggling even they even borrowed qpr's kit i think because they're playing the same thing don't they um couple had been happy with his 11 for this set QPR game, he, he named an unchanged team, which is fantastic. And the Manchester Evening News headline sort of summed up this performance by saying the Blues hit Skid Row. There you go. And the opening paragraph from that little match report from Mr Brian Brett. If Steve Koppel needed to know the enormity of the job he faces in restoring Manchester City's fortunes, this was the result and performances that's illustrated it perfectly. Yes, couldn't say better myself, Brian. Uh, this was made all the worse because uh, Reading actually were hit by eight injuries in that game. 
but they sort of organised themselves, got themselves together uh, and we had no trouble, had no trouble beating City 2-0. Uh, City couldn't deal with Reading's pace up front and to add insult to injury, a certain Trevor Morley had a pretty good game for them as well. Uh, a goal in each half was too much for City, we huffed and puffed and left our 2,500 travelling supporters frustrated yet again. Hey, the one thing that shines through on all these things is the travelling support, absolutely fantastic. Couple's verdict on this game. Well, let's have a look what he thought of this disaster. A 2 0 win for Reading against Manchester City. Our passing was slow, it wasn't crisp. On Saturday, it was crisp and with a purpose, whereas this was so deliberate and laboured. To be absolutely honest, if City was not a big job, I certainly would not be here. Alan Ball will be enjoying the fruits of his labours. It is obvious there is a fair amount wrong. I know on Saturday the players were bound to be lifted. I was hoping that they would carry on at Reading. In terms of effort, I could not really question many people. I think the players tried very hard but a lot of things broke down and we were chasing the ball an awful lot where they hit it on sorry and when they hit us it was with 30 or 40 yard runs and that was the thing that damaged us they were running at the heart of our defense that was what brought the both goals there was no complacency we started slowly struggled to get to grips on the game and found ourselves one nil down i think there was a sense of deja vu in the dressing room I cannot describe it better than this. There you go. So the player ratings, not so good. Dibble 6, Vassal 5, McGoldrick 5, Simmons 6, Summerby 5, Clough 5, Lomas 5, Kinky 5, Brightwell 7, Rossler 5, Dickoff 5, the subs front check, there you go, got a 5, and Cavalashvili, he got another 5. Ref, Mick Pearce got 4 out of 10. Mick Pearce, no. Uh, man of the match, Ian Brightwell. So well, well done, Ian Brightwell. Let's turn that over for the, the next little disaster. Uh, sorry, match report. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but at least at least it was back to the comforts and the home the home comforts of Main Road and uh, our ever cheerful and and are up for it fans of course. Oh, always always positive. Ne never glass half empty. Always glass half full. Mm. Uh, City were severely test going to be tested though because uh, we were playing high, the high flying Canaries. Norwich City who were doing really really well. So this game is going to take place on the 19th of October. Yeah, Main Road's biggest crowd uh, since the opening day turned out. Over 28,000. That wasn't too bad. 28,269. To see City clip the Canaries wings, as they say, with Koppel's first win as a manager. 2-1 victory. Couple had made McGoldrick's uh, move. It was he was on loan permanent with three hundred thousand pound. Perhaps Franny Lee had opened that uh, that purse. That person got his cash out. I think there's a few moths flying about as well. But uh, a three hundred thousand fee to Arsenal. Uh, so there we go. We got uh, his first. Couple got his first sign, although he'd already been there, obviously. But uh, obviously, the, it was thought that Couple had a lot to do with uh, with actually being there and, and getting getting the nod in the end. The headline, well, there we go. What more can we ask? Koppel casting his spell. Let's have a look at the first paragraph. Sure, surely a positive paragraph. Manchester City took half a dozen steps up the first division table and climbed one significant rung up the confidence ladder as the Steve Koppel era began at Main Road course it did it was on we're off we're off we're on a roll summary of the game yeah despite the down performance at reading uh, once again city fielded the same 11 uh, again probably because there wasn't much else to compete to be honest with you uh, but uh, obviously Coppel's faith in the boys sort of worked this time put in a good performance Norwich played really well don't forget we rode our luck a few times uh, the welcome from the city fans to, to Mr Coppel was warmish yes, not over the top but uh, it was a lot better after the game obviously um, this is our club so despite our reservations we'll, we'll normally give players or managers we'll at least give them a couple of games won't we before we start booing them and jeering them so there you go and wanting them out sack, sack them get them out we'll always, always give them at least two games because we're very, you know, that's the sort of city fans, uh, that's what we are, that's what sort of people we are. Uh, it's a bit tongue in cheek, some of this, guys. Uh, a certain Angus Gunn was in goal for Norwich City, yeah, he was wrong footed for City's first from Clough. We had a bit of luck with that one, it took a big deflection, uh, and it certainly was against the run of play. 
And of course, Norwich definitely had the better of the first 45 minutes, but uh, all, all credit to City, we went in a goal up. Uh, but the defence was doing all right. Yeah, the defence had been a bit rickety, uh, was getting away with stuff, but doing okay. City looked far better in the second half. Uh, Dickoff added another on 54 minutes, lifting it over the advancing gun when he broke clear. Uh, Norwich didn't give up, as you wouldn't expect. They got a bit more physical, which was uh, interesting to see for a good footballing team. But uh, City, City held on, but it won't be City unless we put our fans through it a little bit, would it? So uh, a defensive error in the 88th minute led Norwich to grab a goal back. But uh, us on the kickbacks, we were used to this at this stage. We were used to these sort of dodgy, uh, dodgy endings, but we did hold on. Couple's verdict after the match. We got a bit nerve jangling towards the end, but we were very grateful for three points. When you're 18 from top, from the top, you've got to look for qualities and a bit different from the beautiful flowing football. It's been a mountain to climb every match and we do have to dig it out. Had we got no points from the game, we would have been in that nasty little area and people would have been talking about the relegation word and adding to the pressure. Whereas a win like that gives everyone the incentives and confidence. I was so wrapped up in the game, I was not aware that the crowd was getting anxious. I think you were, mate. People pay their money and they have the right to say and do what they want. The players respond more to encouragement than criticism. Is that a bit of a dig, Mr Copple? It's difficult to encourage when you are so frustrated. I understand that. There have been an element of frustration here for so many years. If fans could win you games, then we would be right at the top of the table. Unfortunately, they can't do that. The players have to. There you go. The player ratings that day. Dibble 9. As I said, we did come under a lot of pressure from Norwich City. Uh, Wassel 7. McGoldrick 7. Simmons 7. Or Simon Simon. Uh, Summerby 6. Clough 6. Lomas 7. Kinkladzi 8. Brightwell 6. Rossler 6. And Dickoff 7. Subs Whitley 5. Fronchek and Cavalishvili. Not used. Ref Ken Loach. Or Leach. Yeah, I think I've heard of him. Just about. Refs don't score very well. 5 out of 10. Man of the match. Andy Dibble, there you go. I think uh, most fans were certainly happy coming away from Main Road, and I think uh, I think I was that day. Any, any picture was always nice, especially a game of team that was do, uh, a team that was doing quite well in the league. It wasn't any clear cut by any means, but Norwich were quite a big scalp, and we could sort of look forward to another home game the following following Sunday on Sky. Well, that was that was a, that was doomed to be. Be, uh, to lose wasn't it we never won when we were on television so there you go that was on Sky the following Sunday uh, Wolves had sat fifth uh, and we'd climbed to a dizzying 13th after beating Norwich uh, to add a little bit of insult the publishers of the City Monthly Magazine there, Prospect Media they did other people's magazines as well but uh, Prosport Media went into liquidation but uh, Greater Manchester Publications responsible for things like City Life stepped in and took over the printing of the next issue although it was a little late getting out there's a few complaints but uh, it was a little late getting out of the shelves Subscri subscribers had to wait a little bit longer Couple didn't fancy Jerry Creaney, yeah, we've not spoke about him today. He was loaned out to Ipswich on a month's loan. He wouldn't see Couple at Main Road again. And we would thankfully, sorry, sorry, Jerry, I'm only kidding, only see him once more the following season. That's Jerry Creaney. Uh, City had been struggling to string even a couple of wins on the trot together. And more disappointment happened as City were bull bullied pardon the pun, by Wolves at Main Road on the 27th of October. The evening news headline, one in the eye, Blues made to pay for missing main target. The opening paragraph, Steve Copples, this is a 1-0 win to Wolves. Steve Copples' hopes of serving up the tasty Sunday rolls were ruined by a slice of the old bull. It took just a moment's hesitation by skipper Kit Simons to let in Steve Bull Wolves one-man strike force and City were carved right open. There you go. Summary of this game. A crowd 27,296. Many delayed as major as major disruption on the M6. No surprise there. Nothing changes. Uh, and obviously uh, front check came in uh, after the Norwich game for an injured uh, Brightwell, Ian Brightwell. Wolves defended doggedly, although Rossler thought he'd scored after 73 minutes. See, he hadn't scored for six games at that stage. But ref U U Uriah Rennie, I certainly remember him, had decided that Clough had impeded the Wolves keeper Stowell. Yeah, another City keeper. A bit harsh, but it wouldn't be City's day. Rennie had also waved away a good City penalty appeal just a couple of minutes earlier. On 75 minutes came the sucker punch as Simmons divvied and allowed in Steve Bull to score the one and only goal of the game. The couple verdict. 
He said beforehand that if you stop Steve Ball, then you're probably gone 75% of the way towards stopping Wolves. I thought my two centre halves and marked him ever so well for 89 and a half minutes. Then just one moment where the ball sort of skipped away and he was on it like a flash. Once he had the ball in that sort of situation, you knew where it was going to end up. It was a great finish and I compliment him. From a performance point of view, I could not complain. I thought each and every player made a positive contribution. We had opportunities to score. We had a couple of decisions that perhaps did not go our way uh, with a disallowed goal from a corner and I questioned the decision over the penalty. He played for the penalty, but I felt it was still a foul in the box. I did not want to get bitter and twisted about the referee. I thought he did all right. On another day, I hope we might be saying... Why on earth did he give us that penalty? Hope that it will even up. Well, they say it does, doesn't it? But it doesn't. Phone guy, Dibble 6, Simmons 6, Wassel 6, Summerby 6, Clough 7, Lomas 6, Kinkladzi 7, Whitley 7, Franchet 6, Stickoff 8, Rossler 6, Subs Ingram got a 5, Cavalashvili a 5, and Crooks was not used. Referee Uriah Rennie, uh, yeah, he got, um, he got a 7. I don't know where he's got that from. Here. Flipping awful. Uh, man of the match, yeah, Paul Dickoff. There you go. So there you go. That's the end of this part one. A defeat against Wolves. Not great. So in part two, of course, with Halloween approaching, all hell breaks loose, loose both on and off the pitch. Uh, and of course, the days are numbered for a, a little ill Stevie couple. So join me for that. Thanks for watching. See you later.